about Rob, he's going to play nice and uh, <laughs> share his uh, mic time, or he'll be in a world of hurt. <laughs> Oh, the clicker. Yeah, you want to do it? Okay, great. Yeah, go ahead. Next slide. Hi. So, uh, we're, yeah, we're from Lending Club. We're an online lending marketplace. Uh, we bring borrowers and lenders together, and borrowers get a better rate, and lenders get uh, more money, more better return, and we get a cut. So it feels good. And then today uh, happens to be our 10-year anniversary, um, so it's kind of, uh, kind of fitting here. So we're going to give three insights into the last four years of the evolution of DevOps at this company. I came on about the time that we had uh, the first billion dollars um, of uh, loans issued, and now I'm going to get in trouble with whatever I say, so I'll just say billions and, and billions. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we learned over that time, um, and uh, it's going to, we're going to talk about uh, how we use graphs to manage our infrastructure, and we'll have one demo. All right, let's get started. So number one, who are we? Um, to get this point across, I think a better question to ask would be, who are we not? We are not Netflix, and you guys probably aren't either. Um, it's easy to look at companies like Netflix or Twitter or WhatsApp and try to emulate their success by mimicking their results. Uh, it's easy to read a blog post by Netflix on how we use Kafka with our Keystone uh, pipeline to handle our data streams. And it's easy to say, wow, that's really cool. We should build that too. It's easy for this to happen, too. Um, but what's important to remember is that Netflix has Netflix problems. Twitter has Twitter problems. Lending Club has Lending Club problems. And if you implement a Netflix solution at your company, you may be solving a problem that you guys don't even have. Yeah, I want to call attention to the top line there, which I think is relevant. <laughs> yeah, so what's important is to figure out uh, your company's problem and then to solve those problems. So you can't solve your company's problem if you don't know what the problem is. Um, similar to that, you can't automate all the things if you don't know what the things are. Uh, so looking at this slide, you probably recognize most, uh, if not all, of these tools. Um, so how do we manage? all of these technologies, uh, we all face this problem of figuring out how do all these technologies work together? Do they integrate with one another? Um, what if we want New Relic? Or what if New Relic doesn't play nice with F5? Does that mean we can't use F5? Uh, what if the integrations that we want don't exist? Are we going to make hundreds of uh, REST calls to dozens of endpoints? No. Uh, so at Lending Club, we use graphs to handle uh, all this information. And bear with me now, I'm going to go through a little bit of story time. But um, three years ago, we were dealing with very manual deployments. We were keeping track of our services on an Excel spreadsheet. And we realized we need greater visibility into our infrastructure. We need to answer questions like, is my app live? Uh, are app revisions in sync across all of our environments. I mean, we couldn't even answer questions like, what the heck is out there? Like, what's deployed right now in production? Um, so we created an internal application backed by a graph database to store all this information. And in the beginning, there was nothing in our graph database. Um, but we sort of mimicked the, the life cycle of an app. And we thought, well, apps start in Confluence, so we'll integrate with Confluence. Um, developers and PMs create tickets and track stories through Jira, so we'll integrate with Jira. Um, it'd be cool if our app can create tickets. Developers push to GitHub, we'll track commits, we'll track repos. We build and deploy with Jenkins. Uh, the artifacts get stored in Artifactory. We deploy to Amazon. Like, that's a good one, right? We'll scan the uh, elastic load balancers, auto-scaling groups, EC2 instances, 
And since we have cloud in our, in our app, we'll also we'll get our um, data center load balancer into our graph database. And if you combine load balancer information with our VMware server information, combine that with Jenkins, and you have fully automated deployments. Um, from there, it'd probably be good to have monitoring in there. And so, so we just kept adding more and more to our graph. And I think you can see the growth of our graph model was, um, it happened very naturally and organically. So fast forward three years, we've grown from five microservices to over 400, and they all follow this pipeline, and they just, it's a very smooth process, which is, which is awesome. And so we went from having low service visibility um, to having a central graph model that we can query at any time, and that helps us make sense of our complex and interdependent infrastructure components. All right, so now that I have talked you all to tears, time for a demo. Talked about all this stuff, so now I'll show you some of the stuff. So N Ashley will be using uh, Neo4j, that's the underlying graph database that we use. Yes. Um, and uh, what she's going to be showing here is she's going to live type the queries, and we're going to take real data. We've redacted a little bit of information. Yeah. So this is. This is my local Neo4j, but it is, again, um, from our prod database. I'm going to show you some of our AWS components right here. I've just typed in a super simple query just to show me our accounts. You'll see here there's three non-prod prod infrastructure. And just to reduce some of the clutter, I'm going to uh, limit the results to just come from our prod account. And so what I'm doing here is... Um, this is a simple query again. It shows you everything that's in this prod account. You'll see in blue, this is the account. It's got some S3 buckets, it's got some SNS topics, and it's got four VPCs. Um, so now digging into this one step deeper, let's say we want to see well, what's in these VPCs. And you'll see now we get something a little more interesting. Hold on, let me zoom out. <coughs> so in the blue again, you'll see the account. You'll see the four VPCs in purple, and you'll see that each VPC has a whole lot of security groups and subnets. And not to belabor the point, but if we just go down one more level, um, it kind of that's when it kind of starts to get more interesting. If it will load. So now zooming out again, you'll see all of a sudden we've added EC2 instances, RDS instances, ELBs, auto-scaling groups, and the connections among them is pretty complex, right? Auto-scaling groups can contain, um, can contain instances. ELBs also contain instances. Auto-scaling groups are attached to ELBs, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, this is just AWS, and it gets there are more and more levels that we could go into, but I'm not going to go into all of those. So what we have going on here is continuous scanning uh, within our infra infrastructure. We go out and we talk to AWS. We talk to each one of the systems that uh, Ashley mentioned, call their APIs, pull it in, dump it into Neo4j. So we have a database at any given time that's got one minute latency um, to get out this information. And it's very fast. And we can build all of our infrastructure on top of that. Mm -hmm. So this. Oops. So next, mm, that was the stuff. And the next is, well, how much does this stuff cost? Um, I'm glad you like that. <laughs> um, all right, so this query I have here, um, the EC2 instances that you saw just a minute ago, um, I'm querying for those, and there's a relationship from the EC2 instance to this label that we have called instance type, which just stores the type of the instance and the cost per hour. Um, and this is displaying the monthly cost in descending order, um, grouped by account, region, and instance type. Um, and it's a super simple query. Um, we have reports generated off of this. And 
Um, now let's say then that you were like, okay, this is cool. We see our AWS infrastructure components, but what about bubbling it up to our actual application? Um, so we have a mapping for that too, where we can match our instances to our app definitions. Okay, and this, it's hard to type and write at the same time, so <laughs> just one second. So what we do is we tag all of our EC2 instances with uh, an application name, which includes our app definition app ID. And so we'll match it by that, and we will return maybe the name of the app, a description, a service type, and we'll keep the rest the same. Hopefully this works. Okay, nothing. <laughs> One second. Okay, so this is showing you the name of the app, right? And again, it's in descending order. How much is this app costing us per month? Uh, how many instances? What does it do? Um, and then different service types, API, UI, et cetera, et cetera. And one last demo. What is this, right? I mean, how many times have you guys gotten this question from your boss or maybe your peers? What is, what is, this, what is this IP? So this one, I'm going to copy and paste. But so here we have our app instance. This is a fake IP, obviously. And we're matching that to um, virtual server, pool, and virtual service, which are things that we're pulling from our load balancer. And then again, matching that to our app definition. And so we go from asking, what is this IP, to knowing exactly what it is. We have a host name. We have the app that's deployed on it, um, the revision, how traffic is flowing to this app, and lots of, lots of good stuff. And so we use queries like this um, for monitoring, alerting, um, our uh, release and deployment automation, our cloud orchestration. It's all, it's all backed with Neo, by Neo4j queries. Okay. I'm going to hand it back to Rob. You can... Okay, so to be successful with doing all this stuff, it takes coordination, right? Um, and to get uh, coordination, you need to get a lot of people to do what you want. And how to do that, what we found, and again, just kind of key insight, is just to make it easy, um, just as it was reasonably easy to get some information out about, um, uh, about cost structures that you know people will pay tens of thousands of dollars uh, to do what she would put together there in, uh, in just a few minutes. Um, make it easy and make it awesome. If it's easy, people will follow it. If it's awesome, people will follow it. That's all, all you really have to, have to solve for. So make it so easy that people don't even think about doing anything else. Okay. Delivering four, 400 apps into production and without drama. I mean, I think you guys have all worked at places where pushing things into production is full of drama. We don't like drama. We like to be the Maytag repairman um, sitting there waiting for nothing to happen. Um, <laughs> just, uh, we want the money printing machines to be printing money, and uh, we just sit there and make sure that, uh, that nothing's really happening but making money. Okay, so um, in terms of the key insights, how to break that down, we we'll break it down here and uh, design, uh, build, test, deploy, and run. Uh, just some key ideas. Um, for uh, application design um, at scale, balance uh, freedom and responsibility. And I heard uh, earlier today somebody else uh, uh, gave a, a variation on this, um, which is uh, to balance, uh, sorry, uh, to balance autonomy and constraints. So freedom and responsibility and autonomy and constraints. I think that's great. Um, we've had fantastic luck with a unified pipeline. So build, deploy, test, run, unify that across the organization. Even if the technologies are different, unify that, get people to understand what it means to move applications through. Even if they look, even if they look and act different, make them behave in a consistent way and good things will happen. So if it's a Node app, if it's a Java app, if it's a Go app, make sure that it, it can be uh, deployed, packaged, um, and monitored in a, in a consistent way. 
Okay, this is a this is a key one. Operational metadata. Um, it turns out that it's really important uh, for uh, to deliver a quality product. In terms of deployment and uh, being able to uh, drive one car, you can dri drive one car. You can drive any car. Try to apply that to um, the way you uh, run and deploy your apps. Right? If you can deploy one app, you can deploy any app. So uh, one of the greatest things that I see happening um, with, within our group, we can teach somebody how to deploy one app, and then they can deploy the other 399. They don't have to go to a wiki page. They don't have to go to a run book. They just know how to do it. Okay, and then at the at the run phase, transparency, and what Ashley was showing with Neo4j was one of the keys to uh, was the keys to that is make all this data accessible, put it out in the open, uh, and uh, and people will achieve success. So this is us. Um, we do have some open source software up there that might be of uh, might be of some interest, and uh, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. You have any questions? Yep, we do have time for questions. We'll run the mic to you. <laughs> Any questions? The okay. ones I'm missing? I'm looking at the light. Okay, yep. So in that Neo 4J, when you zoomed out and you had all those relationship you know, lines, how, how did you build those relationships with all the probes and get them all tied together? Did you have a bunch of tags that were very specific to like a relationship type or something? Or is that just a native to Neo4j? Because I've never, I've never seen it. So what we do is we're periodically scanning our AW in that example, right, AWS accounts. And we're making just REST calls to AWS. And AWS is returning information about auto scaling groups or load balancers. And actually within that, it contains the information that you need to make that connection. For example, in um, when you get information like describe auto scaling group, it'll return information about what load balancer it's connected to. You use that and you just create a relationship in Neo4j between those two, between those two nodes, um, and that just kind of builds up then the entire map of AWS or of our load balancer or of uh, Cisco UCS, um, whatever whatever you want. Yeah, it is a Cisco conference. Um, we do have uh, UCS, so you can uh, you can scan the UCS infrastructure and it'll build up the data model. So we've taken the data model that's already there in the API, kind of inferred it, and then put something together. Um, a lot of that um, is there in, in Mercator. There's some Docker support, some AWS support, UCS support. Um, I forget what else we have in there. Very easy.